my friend Steve Dangle here and welcome back! Goodness, I haven't made a video on this channel in a long time and that's because I'm cooking up some fun. Because the NHL season is upon us, which means it's time! It is time for one of the most anticipated videos of the preseason where I talk about the creme de la creme of the Leafs prospects, or as Jesse Blake calls this video, the big PP. I wish he never called it that. My friend, it is time once again for the Leafs Prospect Pyramid. If you're new, if you're new to the concept, here's what the Prospect Pyramid is. Basically, a few years ago, actually heading into Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner's rookie seasons with the Toronto Maple Leafs, I decided I don't like when prospects are ranked 1 through 20. I think it's a waste of time arguing over who is fifth and sixth. Not just that, that's also just not how it works. Like you might have one guy ranked above another guy, but what if they're having a hot month and you get an injury on your NHL team in a certain position? What are you going to do? Are you going to give the call up opportunity to somebody who you had ranked higher a month ago? Or are you going to give it to the guy who's been playing well recently? Because of that, I didn't look at it as ranking prospects four, five, six, seven. I look at it as tiers. This is a guy who's going to be a super star in this league. This is a guy who has a very high chance of making it in this league and he's probably going to be very good but he's not going to be Sidney Crosby. Versus this guy has a solid chance of becoming an NHL player. It's kind of 50-50 and it's kind of 50-50 if he'll be an impact player and moving down from there. Second very important thing, we are not going to talk about guys signed to AHL contracts. It's just pointless because guys on AHL contracts are technically not a part of your NHL system. For example, if the Toronto Maple Leafs have a guy signed to the Toronto Marlies, but not the Leafs, and the Leafs don't own his rights, he's not on an NHL contract, the Leafs can't call him up. So in theory, the Leafs could have the AHL's leading scorer halfway through the season, but if he's not on an NHL deal, they can't call him up. You can sign a player who's on an AHL deal to an NHL deal mid-season, but only if you have the right amount of contract slots. Think about what the Leafs did a couple years ago with Keith Petrozelli. And number three, a big change to this year's prospect pyramid, we're only doing five tiers. Steve, what are you talking about? There's always been five tiers. Yeah, there's been five tiers of players followed by tier six, which is everybody else. The prospects who are just not worth talking about yet. They, they might end up being something now, but are we really going to dedicate all the time and research into making this video? The problem that I've found in making these videos is tier five is usually the biggest or second biggest tier. And those players almost never make the NHL in a meaningful way. So what are we doing here? We're doing tiers one, two, three, and four, and then everybody else. So all statistics in this video are from EliteProspects.com, so shout out to EliteProspects.com. Big shout out to Kyle Cushman from The Score, who you'll see later in this video, and also for helping me out with a little prospect cheat sheet for height, weight, position, all that stuff. And also, shout out to Nick Barden, who you will see later in this video to talk about some Leaf prospects, and we got something fun planned for you. Without further delay, here is the Toronto Maple Leafs 2023 prospect pyramid. In tier one, we have nobody. Nobody. And that's not a bad thing. Most teams do not have a tier one prospect and definitely not teams that have made the playoffs every season since 2017. Chicago has at least one of those players with Connor Bedard. You could maybe even argue Kevin Kurczynski in there, but we're, we're talking about like transformational players. When Matthews was a rookie, I had him in tier one. I had Marner in tier two. In hindsight, I regret that. Marner should have been tier one as well. Man, you could even make the argument for Willie. I might have him in tier two still, but you're basically only getting tier one prospects by drafting in the top 10, probably top five, probably top three, probably top one. Connor Bedard would be in there, a Logan Cooley would be in there, and the Leafs just don't have those guys, and that's fine. So we go to tier two, and they only have one player in there as well, and you could even debate whether or not this player is a prospect still. In tier two, we have Matthew Nyes. Now, I'm gonna say he's tier two because he's only played 10 NHL games. 
three in the regular season, and seven in the playoffs. The reason he's not really a prospect anymore is he looked really good in those 10 games. Like, this is a player who's gonna make the team out of camp. Something unbelievable would have to happen. Like, even if he were to get injured in the preseason, like, maybe they'd send him to the Marlies to, like, get some conditioning, but this is an NHL player. They have a slot set aside for him in the top six as well. This is a guy who had an excellent draft year. He had an excellent year after the draft year. He's a Hobie Baker finalist. And there was some thought that because he played with Logan Cooley in university hockey, that he was a product of Logan Cooley. Not true. We saw Matthew Nyes at the NHL level. He is a puck battle hound. He is gonna win way more of those than he is going to lose might take a few more penalties than you'd like him to but he's going to score goals he's going to set up plays and for the Leafs in the playoffs he was on the ice for basically every impactful goal the Leafs had in the Tampa series not to mention him scoring a bonkers goal a first NHL goal against the Florida Panthers in round two the reason Matthew Nyes is in tier two is because he has an extremely high chance of making the NHL and he has a very high chance of being an M impact player for the Leafs. This is a guy who's going to play over 200 games in his NHL career. I would venture a guess way more than that. He's going to score hopefully a few hundred goals in his career. Like this, this is the sort of thing you can expect for this player. I'm not going to go as far to say like, oh, he's going to be in the Hall of Fame or even he's going to be an all-star. He's going to be top five on the team in scoring, especially because the Leafs have so many high scoring forwards. So this is going to be a very good player, an impact player for the Leafs, a guy who's gonna chip in goals and a guy who is probably gonna consistently play in their top six now, right away. Like he could be a Calder contender with guys like Bedard and Cooley in the league. That's probably gonna be difficult, but he can hopefully sneak into the conversation as a nominee. That's an individual trophy, who cares? Matthew Nyes right away, right away, straight out of college hockey, made the Toronto Maple Leafs better, and he's looking to build on that this season. Now we move on to tier three, and this is a fascinating tier. I think I might have been a little too harsh on this one because I don't have a ton of players in this tier. The Leafs just kind of have a large group, an underrated group of prospects who have a shot at playing NHL games, but not all NHL games are equal. For example, there are prospects who, if a player is day to day, if they're gonna miss a week of action, you'd be comfortable with them eh, filling in for a week or two at the NHL level. Then there are prospects who, if you have a few long-term injuries, you know what? They can fill in for several months. But would you have them play on your playoff roster in a perfect world? No, no. Would you even be comfortable with it? No, not really. And then there's guys who you would trust with the deed to your house. Tier three can produce any of those players. Some of them are good right now, don't have the highest ceiling. Others aren't that great right now, but they have a much higher ceiling. They're, they're the wild cards. For tier three, I wanna start with a late first round pick from this past draft and a surprise, and now he's become the story of Leafs camp so far. Easton Cowan. Now he was not ranked very high, so a lot of people were dumping on the pick the second it was made. Funny enough, the people who watched him play the most, London Knights fans and scouts who watched the London Knights, thought the pick was awesome. And there was this idea that Easton Cowan had a tough first half of the season, but built as it went. You might have seen my tweets on it a little while ago. Let me remind you, there is truth to that. Dividing Easton Cowan's OHL season last year into quarters, so 17 games at a time, he averaged 1.29 shots per game, then 1.588, 1.588 again, then 2.47, and in the playoffs, 3.25, including 21 
points, nine of which were goals in 20 games played. And it kind of makes sense that Cowan would have started slow. He played the vast majority of the previous season in the GOJHL and only made his debut with the Knights really in the playoffs where he had two points in five games. Then he starts as a rookie and he's okay and then gets better and then gets better and then gets better as the season goes on. Now we've got to see him in preseason games and the kid's an animal. With a little bit more on Easton Cowan, here's Nick Barden from the Hockey News. Easton Cowan was a surprise pick by Toronto in the first round of the 2023 NHL Draft, but so far it looks to be paying off. From Leafs Development Camp to the Traverse City Prospects Tournament to his first ever preseason game inside Scotiabank Arena, Cowan has shown his speed, his tenacity on the puck, the way he wears his heart on his sleeve, as well as his sneaky shot, and just his motor on the ice that allows him to keep going and keep pushing opponents to get the puck from them. The 18-year-old caught fire with the London Knights on the back half of last season and really hasn't turned back since. Matter of fact, he was so good in his first preseason game with the Maple Leafs that Sheldon Keefe had to keep talking himself out of playing Cowan too much. And when you get yourself in a situation like that with a prospect, it usually means that that player will turn out to be a great player in the future. And that's what I see from Easton Cowan. Thank you for that, Nick. And I would like to say Nick Barden is actually going to be joining LFR for this upcoming season. Once a week, Nick is going to be joining us for Marley Minute. I'm bringing it back. It hasn't been around for many years, but once a week, he is going to update us on the biggest ongoings of the Toronto Marlies within an LFR video. So for example, disaster hits, Morgan Riley gets hurt. Who are the Leafs going to call up? We'll ask Nick. Nick, who is always at Coca-Cola Coliseum watching the Toronto Marlies and even talking to them. So look forward to that and look forward to Easton Cowan probably lighting up the OHL this season. Second player in Tier 3 and one of the more underrated prospects in the Leafs system, Fraser Minton with the Kamloops Blazers. Minton has a later birthday when it comes to the draft, a July birthday, so he only just turned 19 years old this past summer. From his draft season to last season, Minton had a very small jump in assists from 35 to 36. He had a big jump in goals, 20 to 31, and a decent jump in points, 67, pause for laughter, up from 55. He's got decent size and room to grow. He wore a letter for the Kamloops Blazers last year. This player is pretty good. He was the 38th overall pick in 2022, which means he's only six picks shy of getting picked in the first round. In order to keep the hype train going though, he needs to have a big year with Kamloops or maybe he gets traded. Either way, he's gotta rip that league up. He's gotta be one of the top scorers in the WHL. Last in tier three, he's still holding on. He's one of the most fascinating prospects in the Leaf system, Nick Robertson. Who is a forward, by the way? Did you know that? There was a time where I didn't. Nick Robertson's season started pretty exciting with the Toronto Maple Leafs last year. He was in the lineup. He scored an overtime winner, actually snapping that streak that the Leafs had where they couldn't win in overtime to save their lives. That turned into five points in 15 games at the NHL level. Eh. And if you're wondering what his numbers on the Marlies were, um, he played two games. He had two points in those two games, but he only played two games. Nick Robertson is in an extremely frustrating stage where could he play in the NHL? Yeah, I think most Leaf fans would be comfortable with him playing a little bit in the NHL. What about for long stints at a time? Eh, sure, it'd be nice to see him play any kind of professional hockey for long stints at a time. What about in the playoffs? Eh, and that's where you see he still has something to prove. And that's normal. It's normal for a prospect, especially, and that's normal. It's normal. It's normal for a prospect to have something to prove. If you had nothing to prove, they'd just give you a roster spot, wouldn't they? But you can't prove yourself if you're constantly, constantly rehabbing an injury and trying to come back from it. We're very early in Leafs training camp, but after the first two preseason games, the Leafs have divided up their groups and appear to have made like semi cuts where guys aren't officially cut from camp, but they've separated the AHL and NHL groups. And one of the biggest observations from that, Nick Robertson is still with the NHL group. There is a path where 
even without injuries, Nick Robertson could make this NHL lineup. I've talked about this many times, but there was an age group of prospects who was particularly screwed by COVID and the shutdown. And I thought Robertson benefited from that. And we now know with hindsight that he didn't benefit from that at all. The way he benefited from it is he got to play in the NHL and in the AHL earlier than he should have. But like in his final OHL season in 46 games, he had 55 goals. No, he did not misspeak. 55 goals in 46 games and 86 points. And he still had another year of junior eligibility. So if you wonder why the Nick Robertson hype was so high, that's why. That's who this player can be. If this guy can stay healthy, there is no doubt in my mind he can be a solid NHL player. But that has to happen first. And with that, yeah, I told you I was pretty harsh. That's the end of tier three. Tier four, which is our final tier, has the lion's share of Leafs prospects. And some of them are in there because they have a low shot of making it, but a decently high ceiling. Others have an okay shot of making it, but not a very high ceiling. Some of the players who I've put in tier four before, Nikita Soshnikov, he ended up playing in the NHL. Zach Hyman, uh, that guy is a star in the NHL, or at very least a premium complimentary player. So what types of players can we find in the Leaf system? Well, let's have a look. Roni Hirvonen is a very interesting prospect in the Leaf system. Another former second round pick. The Leafs have a lot of those on account of they trade most of the first round picks away. After getting drafted out of Finland in 2020, what you want out of a prospect is to see growth over the years. And Hirvonen has given you that every single season. Went from 16 points to 21 to 26 to 28. And that might not sound like a lot to you, and it's not really, but it's Finland and they don't score a lot there. Last year, he had a healthier season with 57 games. His points per game went down a tiny bit, but his goals per game went up. He went from nine goals to 15. He was fourth on his Finnish team in goals last year, but the three guys above him were 27 years old, 31, and one was 23, but it's Christian Veselainen, who is a former first round pick of the Jets. Despite having four seasons in the Finnish league under his belt, Roni Hirvonen is only 21. And what is fascinating is he's finally gonna have his first full season with the Toronto Marlies on North American ice. Might even get called up if he's good. Now this didn't look like it was gonna be a thing that was possible a few months ago because you might remember at a Leafs prospect tournament game, a blue and white game between exclusively Leafs prospects, uh, Dillingham laid him out. Like knocked Hirvonen cold on the ice and he was just lying there and I thought, Andreas Janssen, 2016, we're not gonna see this guy for a while. And here he is in camp and everything. I, I can't believe it. You don't ever wanna have to learn that lesson, but if you're going to, you might as well learn it early. We'll see how he does in his first season on North American ice for the left winger. Up next, this one's disappointing, Topi Niemela. We'll see how this goes because Niemela was incredible in Finland. He was an undersized defenseman playing in a grown men's league in Finland before he was even a legal adult. There was reason to be excited about this guy, especially because he shoots right. Then two seasons ago in 48 games, he puts up 10 goals, 32 points. That's really good. Then last year, 18 points in 58 games. What? Now we did get to see Niemela on North American ice last year. He had two points in six games in the regular season with the Marlies, followed by five points in seven in the playoffs. That's not bad. He already made the low light reel in the preseason with a giveaway, but one giveaway doesn't necessarily make your entire career, especially when it's in the preseason. Niemela with a full NHL, uh, rather AHL North American season under his belt should be fascinating, but there's not much justification in putting him in tier three after an 18 point season falling from 32 in Finland. But that's just my take. Let's see what Kyle Cushman has to say. I think it's easy for Leafs fans to look at the elite prospects page or hockey TV page of Topi Niemela and be down on him as a prospect. After all, he went from 32 points a couple years ago to just 18 points last year, despite playing more games and being in a similar role in the Finnish Liga. So why should Leafs fans still like this player as a prospect? There's a lot of raw skill there in Topi Niemela. And when he was drafted, 
He was kind of envisioned in a very different role than what he's kind of blossomed into over these last couple of years. I think the heights of two years ago are too high and the lows of last year are too low in terms of his scoring. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle for him as a player. And after all, when he was drafted, he was kind of envisioned as this modern two-way defensive defenseman who was good defending the rush and transitioning the puck out of the zone. When he was drafted after the draft in 2020, the Leafs director of amateur scouting at the time, John Lilly, described Niemela as having some of the best defensive instincts in the draft. So I think the ex- offensive explosion that we saw at the World Juniors and in 21-22 from Yamla, uh was maybe a little bit unexpected, I think is the way to describe it, and that he might not reach those same heights, but is still a very skilled player that is easily the best defensive prospect in the Leafs system. I think we saw that a little bit when he came over to North America at the end of last season. He took the power play one spot with the Marlies, jumped onto the top pairing with Jordy Ben in the playoffs, and looked great in that role, putting up a handful of points in a Marley's team that kind of disappointed in the playoffs. So for Niemela, I'm very excited to see what he can do this year with his full, first full year in North America and kind of see where he's at in terms of his game, whether he can be a legit power play quarterback, whether he can be a legit driver of offense at 5-on-5, five five, and if he can handle some more physicality in the smaller rank here in North America. But make no mistake, I know the numbers look the way that they do, but Topi Niemela is still a very good prospect as a right-handed shot who has very good puck-moving skills. And I think he's somebody that will kind of find his game again this season in the AHL and be on track to make an NHL debut potentially in a couple years' time. Next, this guy's sneaky. Nick Moldenauer, the forward from the Chicago Steel, which was one of the favored programs of Kyle Dubas had a really good season last year. 30 goals and 75 points in 55 games in the USHL. And he wasn't even the top scoring player on his team. Top scoring player had 11 more points than him. And you might know the name Mac Celebrini. And if you're like, Max Celebrini, why do I feel like I know that name? That's because that kid just might go first overall at the 2024 draft. With more on Moldenhauer, here's Nick Barden. Nick Moldenhauer is one of Toronto's most underrated prospects, at least to me. Nearly a year and a half after the Maple Leafs selected him in the third round of the NHL draft, I consider the 19-year-old to be one of Toronto's top prospects. Moldenhauer brings a lot of strength to his game, whether it be from his skating, his shot, or even his puck protection, and that often gives him the edge over his opponents. After scoring 30 goals and 45 assists in just 55 games last season with the USHL's Chicago Steel, Moldenhauer is now off to the University of Michigan. His goal there is to play a more pro-style game, and for Maple Leafs assistant GM Haley Wickenheiser, she wants to see him dominate at that level. To me, he could be a year or two out from going pro, but that really all depends on how his game translates to the NCAA level. But if there's anything to be said, it's that the Maple Leafs got a good prospect in the third round with the Mississauga Ontario native. I'm fascinated to see what this guy eventually does at pro. He's going to have a big year. He's playing with a big name player. Next, we have Ty Voigt. And man, this guy is the most Kyle Dubas pick that has ever existed. He's extremely small from a pro standpoint. He's five foot nine, and there are five foot nine guys in the NHL, but he's listed at 151 pounds on Hockey DB. Kyle Cushman's cheat sheet was a little kinder. It had him at 157. And you look at that information and you go, oh, Kyle. And then you look at 105 points in 67 OHL games and you go, oh, Kyle. But my favorite thing about Ty Voigt and his journey isn't that he's a small player that puts up big numbers. It's that when the Leafs drafted him in the fifth round in 2021, he hadn't played a game that season because there was no OHL to play in. Since not playing that season and then getting drafted, in 134 OHL games, he's put up 185 points. He had 105 points with the Sarnia Sting last year, and the closest teammate to him only had 82 points. Another player had 79. No one else scored 50 or more. And of course, Ty Voigt followed that up with 16 points in 16 games in the OHL playoffs. Like, this guy can play. At 20 years old, he's probably not going to get taller. There's a chance he could put on at least 
some weight who knows what this guy is going to turn into because he seems well above his peers at the ohl level but the Leafs drafted him because they want him to be a good pro. Next up, we have another forward with Ryan Twerberg. Average size, 5'11", buck 87. He went from 7 points in 14 games with the University of Connecticut to 32 in 36. It was extremely encouraging. Then last year, no growth in that regard, 30 points in 35 games. Now, only two of his teammates scored more than him, and one of them was Matthew Wood, who was just the 15th overall pick of the Nashville Predators in 2023. Obviously, Wood is younger. Torberg had a seven-game audition with the Toronto Marlies last year, where he put up zeros across the board, except for uh, penalty minutes and plus minus where he was a minus. Not exactly the greatest start to his pro career, but it was just a cup of coffee. We'll see if Twerberg can live up to the hidden gem hype. Up next, Pontus Holmberg. Now, I debated even putting him in the prospect pyramid, but I mean, he is a prospect. He's under 25, guy on an NHL contract who's not on your NHL team, but could be on your NHL team. He's basically the type of player I described earlier. If you needed him to play a few games for the Leafs this season, would you mind? No, no, he's, he's fine. If you needed him to play a long term, for the Leafs, several dozen games. Yeah, fine, fine, he'd be fine. We've seen it. We've seen him do it last year, he was fine. Would you want him on your playoff roster? Eh. Listen, Holmberg started pretty good with the Leafs and then as he got bigger challenges, he fizzled a little bit. He was a good depth player for the Leafs, but he can put up points. He did in Sweden. Now, let's see what he can do with the Marlies. And they did that last year in 38 games, 10 goals, 12 assists, 22 points. That's not bad. It's also his first full season on NHL ice or on North American ice, which is relevant. And in the Marley seven game playoff run, he had eight points. Six of them were goals. Six goals in seven playoff games. This is a guy who has one playoff MVP in Sweden. It's starting to look like, yeah, this guy might have an extra gear when the games mean more. And the Leafs could, uh, Use that. Up next, yet another forward, and you're starting to see the problem when it comes to Alex Steves. He has had two cups of coffee in the NHL, both of them three games each, and he got his NHL point, his first career NHL point with an assist. He has proven that putting up the points in the AHL is not a problem. He had a 46 point campaign followed by a 51 point campaign last year. But at 23 and turning 24 in December, what's your thing? You know what I mean? Like, who are you taking out of the lineup? He can play center, and that is appetizing on account of the Leafs do not have a ton of center depth, or at least guys who you know are going to play center every night at the professional level. You know are going to play center every night at the NHL level. Lots of guys get drafted or signed at a junior playing center, but that's not where they end up in the NHL. Steves is kind of what we've seen out of a lot of Leaf prospects in recent years. Can he play games? Can he fill in? Yeah, they can. But at some point, you'd like to see a guy take a job, really stand out. That's why the Leafs, I think, are holding on to Easton Cowan for as long as they are. He wowed in his preseason debut. Somewhat similarly to Alex Steves, Nick Abruzzese. Yet another guy who has played some cups of coffee in the NHL and looked pretty good. Last year, did you know he got into two games? He scored two points and he had seven points in seven playoff games last year with the Marlies and in the regular season he filled the nets for the Marlies. He, he was their third leading scorer. Third behind Alex Steves at number two and Logan Shaw, the captain, at number one. Another guy who can play center. That's good. He's not really going to fill the net for you as a goal scorer, but he's a super creative playmaker. I actually really like watching him play. Not the biggest, not the smallest either. Again, now that we have like a full body of work from Kyle Dubas, you're seeing that the organization just has a ton of these guys. And at 24 years old, it's kind of, all right, figure it out, buddy territory. Maybe what he is is just a really good AHL scorer and a dependable call-up option if you need. As a center, I'm sure you could play him on the wing if you needed to, but the Leafs organization has so many wingers anyway. This is another guy who needs to wow. He needs to wow in the preseason, wow at the AHL level. He's got to take a roster spot away from someone. Next is a 
fascinating Leaf prospect who I think was a really sneaky good pick a couple years ago in Montreal. 135th overall in 2022, Nikita Grabenkin, or Grabyonkin. It, it completely depends. EliteProspects.com spells it Greb Yonkin. HockeyDB spells it G-R-E-B-E-N-K-I-N. Grabenkin. Steve, did you just click on the wrong player? No. Toronto Maple Leafs, 5th round, 135th overall, 2022. Now, Nikita Grabyonkin is not going to be Matt Mitchkov, but it's related to a rant I had about Matt Mitchkov earlier this season. And Grabyonkin made me say this last season. The best way to develop a player in the KHL is get them the heck out of the KHL. Because if a player, a young player especially, can score at the KHL level, that means they're good because they don't really like even playing young players in the KHL. But the KHL's ability to send you here, there, and everywhere and do this ridiculous game of musical chairs is so silly. Last season alone, Nikita Gerbyonkin played for four teams. Four in three different leagues! Seven games in the KHL with Metallurg Magnitogorsk, four games in the VHL, which is like the KHL's minors, one game in the MHL, which is like the junior level, he had three assists, and then finally, 45 games with Amor Habarovsk where he had 26 points. That's really good for a player his age. What is his age, by the way? He's 20 and he was 19 for the majority of last season. He didn't turn 20 until May. For more on this potential diamond in the rough, here's Kyle Cushman. Scouting in the Russian Junior League is difficult. You look at the history of the league, and there are players that have scored 80, 90, even 100 points in that league that haven't gone on to do anything in the KHL, let alone in the NHL. So looking back a couple years at the 2022 draft when the Leafs took Nikita Grubyonkin in the middle rounds, I wasn't really sure what to make of the pick at the time. He was taken as an overager, meaning he had been eligible for the previous year's draft and wasn't taken. So despite putting up good numbers in the junior league and having a good playoff run, I wasn't really sure what to make of the player until we saw him at the pro level. And at the start of last season, it looked like we were going to have to wait on that. He didn't really get any minutes to start the year with his KHL team, bounced between the VHL and the MHL until a couple months into the season, he was finally loaned to a different KHL team, Amor Khabarovsk, where he started to flourish. He got top six minutes, power play time, and ended up putting up 26 points in 45 games as a 19-year-old in the KHL after joining his new team. Those totals were good enough to win him KHL Rookie of the Year. So this year, being back with Metallurg Magnitogorsk, his parent team, and a much better KHL team, he's played himself into a top nine role on a legit KHL team as a 20-year-old, which is not an easy feat to do. So Grabyonkin, in my opinion, is a player that Leafs fans should at least know the name of, Going into these next couple of years, he's not small. He's listed at six foot two, over 190 pounds now after putting on some size the last couple of years. He's a skilled playmaker, especially along the boards, getting pucks in front. And he's somebody that over these next couple of years, maybe making a Marley's debut a couple of years down the road, I think he's somebody that can make an impact in the NHL a few years down the road. And I think he's somebody that Leafs fans should keep an eye on for these next couple of years before he comes to North America. Not many skaters left in tier four, but this one is a guy who I'm fascinated by, William Villeneuve. It's unlikely we'll see him in a Leaf uniform this upcoming season, even as a call-up, but the Leafs used, what, 10, 11, 12 defensemen last season? Guys like Mac Hollowell and Philip Kroll were playing actual NHL games, putting up points too. Villeneuve was written off a bit when he was drafted in the fourth round in 2020 because he put up a bunch of points in the Quebec League, which you're able to put up points in the Quebec League pretty easily, and his defensive game was shocking. His final season in the queue, I just want to read the stats because they're very funny. Eight goals, 48 assists for 56 points in 64 games as a right shot defenseman. Plus minus of plus 60. <laughs> yeah, he's okay. Last season with the Toronto Marlies, that's pro hockey, he had 25 points as a rookie defenseman in 54 games. That was the second highest point total by any Marlies defenseman. Really interested to see what Villeneuve becomes because he's got that high-end thing that the Leafs were looking for when they drafted him. Otherwise, he just won't work out at all. Everyone uses TJ Brennan as this example for like a guy who is really good at the AHL level, but it never translates to the NHL. 
He's been playing pro hockey since 2009, and he's actually still playing in Switzerland this season. Uh, if he's a cautionary tale, sign me up for that cautionary tale. Most dudes who end up playing junior would kill for that cautionary tale. We end with three skaters who I really considered putting in tier five until I got rid of tier five and then decided these players were too good for tier five. I'm really excited to see what Brandon Lasowski can do, a seventh round pick from 2022. Undersized, yet again, five foot nine. Average weight, though, at about a buck eighty. Fifty-eight points in sixty-eight WHL games in his draft year. Then seventy-one points in sixty-five games last year. Thirty-eight of them goals. Not to mention thirteen points in eighteen WHL playoff games. The Leafs have some talent in the WHL. Again, he's got to have another really good year in junior. He's got two points in two games so far. Pretty good. But at the end of the day, we're not really going to know what the Leafs have in these guys until they play pro. Next, we have a player who's kind of bounced around the prospect pyramid. Another forward, Dmitry Avchinikov. Another undersized forward, five foot eleven, about like a buck. 60 between a buck 60 buck 70 he only just turned 21 in august but he was playing full seasons in the khl he got in 68 games with sabir nova sabirsk which is a task within itself to even get into those games but he didn't put up a ton of points 13 he had a cup of coffee with the marlies you can't really gauge much from that It'll be fascinating to see what he can do with a full season on North American ice. The Marlies have a lot of prospects, like a, a lot of guys who can be called up, which you haven't always been able to say in recent years. It's been a lot of guys on AHL deals. The potential is there with Ovchinikov, but long shot. And lastly, a defenseman out of the University of Minnesota, Michael Koster. This is the guy who, you, you know that meme of Kyle Dubas on two phones at the same time? Supposedly, as the story goes, he was on the phone with Michael Coster after drafting him in the fifth round. Now, being a fifth round pick from 2019, it's a little while ago now, fifth round pick, out of sight, out of mind. Dude, the right-handed defenseman exploded offensively for the University of Minnesota last year, going from a career high of 14 points to 29. He was the second highest scoring defenseman on the University of Minnesota team. The highest was Jack Lacombe, who was drafted in the second round in 2019 by the Ducks. There could be something here. He's got to have another good season, but again, you need to dominate at the pro level for us to really know what's there. Lastly, we end with the goalies, and this might surprise you a bit. Vyacheslav Peksa, I really like, but again, KHL prospect, he was in three different leagues last year. Didn't actually get into a game with Akbar's Kazan of the KHL, but he did play two in the MHL and 40 in the VHL. His record was poor at 13, 19, and six, but he stopped a lot of pucks with a 921 save percentage, you can't control the team you're on, but it sure looks like this guy is uh, uh, potentially going to make the jump to North America. Unfortunately, with the Ivan Fedotov situation, the KHL ripped up the transfer agreement that they had with the NHL, and it's really muddied the waters on who can and can't play where. It was leaked on social media. It looks like Pexa has his Toronto Maple Leafs pads. And on EliteProspects.com, Pexa's 2023-24 team is listed as... The Marlies. So we'll see what happens there. Up next, another KHL goalie, Archer Aktyumov. I've liked this guy from the moment the Leafs drafted him. 943 save percentage in almost 40 VHL games. That's so stupid. But true to form, he's already played in two different leagues this year. He's played three games in the VHL and he actually made a KHL appearance with Akbar's KZ. Some stability would be nice, but I, I don't even know if that's a KHL thing. It's, you know, he signed up to be a goalie and that's tough. Last but certainly not least, pause for a gasp if you've been paying attention, Dennis Hildeby, the Hilda Beast. Hildeby was drafted in the fourth round in 2022 and the Leafs signed him like right away. He is enormous. Six foot six, listed at over 230 pounds. He is bigger than Freddie Anderson in both height and weight, and Freddie was a big boy. 918 save percentage in 21 games in Sweden last year. He did have a cup of coffee with the Marlies. It didn't go great, but I'm not going to judge him off of two games. His first full season in North America is going to be fascinating because I think the Leafs have big things begged for this guy. Notably not making the prospect pyramid and falling under the category of everyone else, Keith Petrozelli, who is a really interesting story, a decently high draft pick, 
of the Detroit Red Wings, and he doesn't sign with the Red Wings, and the Leafs get him, and then they end up signing him to an NHL contract, and it sure looks like he's fallen behind some of his teammates, doesn't it? At the end of the day, he's on an NHL contract. He could be called up. The Leafs might have to call upon him, and he could rebound, but the Leafs actually have quite a few goalies, and I'd be surprised if they didn't hit on at least one of them. And that's not including Joseph Wolf, who I wouldn't count as a prospect on account of he's the team's backup goalie right now. So, what did you think of this year's prospect pyramid? What do you think about going down from six tiers to five? I think it's a lot neater. Is there anyone you would have put higher? Anyone you would have put lower? But for now, I got a lot more preseason work to do. So that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you like this prospect pyramid video. Click subscribe if you really liked it. Tell all your friends, hey, subscribe to the SDPN YouTube channel. We have been making banger after banger after banger. This summer, this off season, this preseason, we are cooking, baby.